ship going in the opposite direction, and there was a gigantic storm, and he was thrown overboard, and he was, was swallowed by uh, some kind of sea creature, and then he pl- prayed to God, and God, and the sea creature um, delivered him back to the land of Israel. The plan was that God doesn't give prophecy outside the land of Israel. There are some exceptions, but generally not. So Jonah said, if I leave the land of Israel, everything will be okay. Well, yeah, except that God can bring you back if he wants. So he comes back and he gets the, 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 the order again. That's when he goes to, to Nineveh. Now the question is, what was Jonah's resistance? Why was he uh, unwilling to carry out this command? There are a couple of reasons given. One is that he anticipated that they might do tshuva. And if they do tshuva and escape punishment, that will look bad in comparison to the Jewish people who had been warned about their failures so many times and did not do tshuva and would be held against them. And he didn't want to be party to any process that could increase the severity of the judgment against the Jewish people. That was one of his motivations. Another of his motivations is, if I'm going to go to the, the city of Nineveh, I'm going to say, in 30 years, uh, sorry, 30 days, the city is going to be overturned, and they do tshuva, and God is merciful and doesn't destroy the city, I'm going to be accused of being a false prophet. Because what I prophesied didn't come true. And what he didn't realize, what Jonah didn't realize, says the Ramchal, is that the words, I mean, the Chazal say it, that the word Nehefeches, overturned, could be a moral description, not a physical description. That their uh, values and the organization of the state and the prosecution of justice will be revolutionized. And therefore, what he's saying will come true under any case. Just the meaning will be different. And he didn't understand that there was a double meaning. So this is something which also a prophet can, can fail at. So even though a meaning that was meant for him to understand and to communicate was given to him, there may be another meaning which he doesn't understand. Now, how to reconcile that clearly with the original description where he understands everything and knows it clearly without any doubt, without any mistake, with every possible application, before and after, causes and effects, I'm not satisfied that I can, I can make as much uh, consistency out of it as I would like to see. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not satisfied with my own understanding. But that's what he says here, that he could make a mistake like that. I'm also disturbed about something else. The Rambam says in uh, the Parish Mishnayis, in, in the Hagdama, prophecy, um, there are four possible categories. You can, divide, actually, you can divide prophecy into four categories. And in only one of them, if it's a prophecy, a prophecy about the future, in only one of them is it absolute. In only one of them must it happen. The other three don't have to happen. The prophet comes and says, in God's name, ABC will happen. Three out of four don't have to happen, even though he says in God's name that it will happen. So what are the categories? So there are two two distinctions. One distinction is, is the prophecy said, is the prophecy meant for the prophet himself or for someone else? And the second is, is that a prophecy of something good or something bad? Only if the prophecy is a prophecy of something good and it's for somebody else must it come true. If it's a prophecy for the prophet himself, it doesn't have to come true. And if the prophecy is something bad for other people, it doesn't have to come true. The, the applica- By the way, half of this is, is explicit in the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, the Babylonians are banging at the gates of Jerusalem, and there are many false prophets who are telling the king, don't worry, 
the Babylonians can't capture Jerusalem, God will not abandon his house. God will not abandon the city that he has chosen, and there it's invulnerable, and nothing will happen. Jeremiah alone is prophesying defeat. For which they accuse him of treason and they lock him up. It's a whole long story. You can read it over there. So, but then Jeremiah says to the false prophets, we're not on a par, you and I, because if what you say fails, you're false prophets, because you're prophesying something good for the people of Jerusalem, that they're invulnerable and the Babylonians can't, can't succeed in, in, in conquering the city. So if that fails and they do conquer the city, that proves that you're false prophets. But I, I'm prophesying something bad, that they will win the war and they will conquer the city. If they, in fact, do not conquer the city, I'm not a false prophet. Now here's the understanding of it, because a prophecy of something bad happening has the content of a warning. It's always conditional. Because whenever God... Um, describes a, a disaster in the future, it can always be avoided if the people do tshuva, always. So, that being the case, almost always. General rules have exceptions, but almost always. So that means, and you won't know beforehand which one this is, so if, it, if it's a prophecy of something bad happening, it only has the form of a warning, in which case it doesn't have to happen. And the, the practical uh, the practical difference between them is this. Suppose you want to test somebody to see if he's a prophet. So we spoke about this. The criterion for testing a prophet is that he has to be a scholar. He has to keep the Torah. He has to have good moral character. And he has to do something supernatural. Supernatural thing could be telling the future. Or it could be uh, knowing things that other people can't know. There are various things that he could do to demonstrate some kind of supernatural power. Now, he says... Q is going to happen. Can we use that as a test of his supernatural power? Well, if Q is something bad, you can't. Because even if God told it to him, it doesn't have to happen. So you can't use it to test him and say, well, if it happens, then we believe you. And if it doesn't happen, we don't believe you. Because even if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, it doesn't mean that he's lying. He's got to prophesy something good. Then if it doesn't happen, you have convicted him of lying. This is all the more so if the prophecy that the prophet receives is for him himself. There, it's almost, it's always under the subject of there's a, a condition that you have to deserve it. So even if it's a prophecy of something good, it's conditional. Maybe he won't deserve it. When God gave prophecy to Jacob when he's leaving the land of Israel and promised to protect him and help him and, and uh, so provide for him, and Jacob immediately makes a vow, if God will protect me, and if God will help me, and if God will provide for me, the commentator said, if? If? Jacob, God just promised you that. And the answer, based on Chazal, is that, sure, he was told it's going to happen, but when you tell an individual, and God tells an individual something good is going to happen to him, it's always subject to a hidden condition. You have to deserve it. And there's no guarantee that he'll deserve it. So, a statement to an individual good or bad, a prophecy to an individual, good or bad, doesn't have to happen. A prophecy of something bad to others doesn't have to happen. Only a prophecy of something good has to happen. So it seems to me, on the basis of that, that those principles, Jonah ought to have known, even without understanding the ambiguity of the word nehefeches, overturned, even without knowing that that word could have two meanings, either a physical meaning or a moral meaning, he should have been able to realize that if God doesn't destroy the city, that doesn't mean that his prophecy is false. Now, it's possible that he, would, he understood himself that it wouldn't be false, but he's afraid that they would think it was false. If the, if the, if the word nefechus would have only a physical meaning, physical destruction, and he comes into the city and says, in 30 days... It's over, guys. The city's going to be destroyed, and it ends up not destroyed. Then maybe they. Uh, uh, summertime. <laughs> so I don't know. If you don't want anybody to get hurt. Where is he? Where 
we don't have too many guys. Let's go upstairs to the library. They they lodge in the ceiling here. Yeah, okay. They lodge in the ceiling here because the ceiling is a false ceiling. It's an empty ceiling. Is the, is the window open? It's here. Is the window open? No. He's out. Okay. Well done. Well done. What about the spiders? Okay. Fine. So, if it may be the question of, of their not understanding and thinking that the prophecy came false, but I, I find that difficult also because if they felt the prophecy was absolute and they didn't realize that by doing tshuva they could, they could avoid it, why did they do tshuva? Just out of desperation? I don't know. I have trouble with the, with the, with the details of the story. But that's the, 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 the fact is that the prophet is meant to understand something. What he's meant to understand, he understands without, without any failure possible. But there may be something else in it which, you know, in terms of his, his um, prophecy to them, he's warning them that the, the place is going to be destroyed because of the evil things that they're doing. For that, you only need the meaning of nefechus to mean physically overturned. You don't need the meaning of also possibility of, 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 of a, a moral revolution. So, and then and the Rav Chal says he didn't get that. There's a factor about, uh, about prophecy that you have to know. Then, I'll read you what the Rav Chal says about the next subject, and then I'll tell you what, what other people say. I find this a little surprising. Uh, for coming from the Ramchal, but since we're studying his Sefer, this is what he says, so I'll read to you what he says. Um, he says, in, the, in every prophecy, there is there are two aspects. One is the meaning of the prophecy, and the other is the words in which the prophecy is delivered. He says, because it happens that sometimes that a prophet will understand a certain meaning, and what will be given to him is only the meaning, not the words. And then the prophet chooses the words to express it. And then sometimes he's given a meaning and the words to express it with. So now he says, oh, that the the prophets whose prophecy was written for the generations, the ones we have recorded, there even the words were, were dictated. But as I told you uh, a couple of times, from the time of Exodus until the time when prophecy stopped, the beginning of the Second Temple, there were a million two hundred thousand prophets, six hundred thousand men, six hundred thousand women. Every Jew knew prophets. The Ramban says that if you had a physical problem, some kind of medical problem, you went to a prophet, and he told you where your spiritual failure was, and on the basis of fixing the spiritual failure, the physical problem was also repaired. Why would you treat the symptom? The whole of your physical condition is only a symptom for your spiritual condition. Medicine will tell you, treat the disease, don't treat the symptom. The disease is, spir- is spiritual. Those prophets could be given an idea without being given words. What he wants to, de- to, to um, establish here is that the definition of prophecy doesn't need to include words. As a matter of fact, the words of the prophets who are recorded for the for the generations, the they their their prophecy, the words are always the the words that were given by by God, not their own not their own words. Now that makes a gigantic difference because it means that if there are certain subtleties in the words, or certain implications in the words, then those implications, since the words were chosen as part of the deliverance of the of the prophecy, those those extra 
elements will be intended, unless you make a mistake in interpreting it, but otherwise they'll be intended. Now, there is some discussion of this subject. The Barbanel took a position against this idea. He said that if you look in the prophet of Jeremiah, and the prophet of Isaiah, and Ezekiel, and others, you'll see two things. First of all, they prophesy, with, they write with different styles. Their books are written in quite different styles. Isaiah is high poetry, full of allusions and, and, uh, and uh, tricky uh, verbal constructions. I once went through it with the commentators, and the commentators are split on many passages, exactly how to understand them. Jeremiah, almost all of it, is very straightforward, plain, simple Hebrew. So Rabbi Nell says, look at their backgrounds. Jeremiah was a farmer. He was recruited as a, as a, as a, uh, as a mature man to become a prophet. And Isaiah came from a noble family and had a noble education. The, the words express their command of the language and their thought structure and the rest. That's one proof that the words are really the words of the prophet, not the words that God gave him. And the second is, he says, you look in the book of Jeremiah, that's where the Barbara mm -hmm. says in the introduction to his commentary on Jeremiah, you'll see lots of mistakes in the language. And uh, Jeremiah was a prophet for 30 years, more, and you don't see any improvement in his Hebrew. So you think, if he's a rude farmer and he's recruited to be a prophet, starting there, you could understand that he would speak a fractured Hebrew. But if over 30 years um, he, he, uh, he, uh, he continued to continue to, to do the same thing, this was the way he spoke. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is the way he spoke. And he spoke in the language that was familiar to him. So this is... Um, this is the Barbanel's thought that, that the words were not given by God. The, the Malbim is fire against the, against the Barbanel. Uh, that in all of the prophets, every word was given by God, just like the Ramchal says. And he says, the difference in style between the prophets does represent, it does reflect their difference in education. But if you will have, let's say, Jeremiah, and God will give him Isaiah's words to speak as a prophet, and someone will stop in the middle and say, what does that mean? Jeremiah says, darn if I know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God gave me the words? I'm communicating the words. But what do they mean? <laughs> it's above me. That's not the point. The point is that he should communicate a meaning to the people. So um, the difference in style reflects the fact that God will give to the prophet words that are appropriate for him to use. But it doesn't mean that he invented the words. It doesn't mean that he authored the words. And as far as the book of Jeremiah with its, with its uh, grammatical mistakes, says the Malbim, if you tell me when he started his career, his Hebrew was fractured, I understand that. But he's a prophet for 30 years. He spoke to kings. He spoke to nobles. He spoke in various sophisticated places. If it was just a question of his language, it ought to have improved. And it doesn't change. That means it was meant to be what you're calling mistakes and fractured language exactly the way God wanted it to be communicated for whatever reasons are, are involved. And I think that this is the majority reason, the majority position, that the words of the prophets are themselves words chosen by God. So at that point, the question arises, which we're going to discuss in a little while. So then if Moses got words which are chosen by God and and the, all the other prophets' words were chosen by God. What's the difference between their prophecies? We will talk about that. The remaining question is the writings. You know that the Hebrew Bible is divided into the five books of Moses, and then the prophets, and then the writings, like the Psalms, and like Proverbs, and like uh, Song of Songs. And uh, What's their status? Many say that there they were written not with prophecy, but with what we call the Holy Spirit, Ruch HaKodesh, which is a lower form of divine inspiration, and that there they chose their own words. There is a shita against it. Um, I, th I think it's a brisker shita, if I'm not mistaken. And they make a very interesting point. Why are they called writings? What's that? If it's a lower level of inspiration or a lower level of authority, whatever it is, why call them writings? I said, no, because the prophets were given material to speak they spoke it in public. 
Some had scribes that wrote down what they spoke. They didn't write books. Here, the inspiration was given to the people who received it to write it down. Here, the, 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 mind, the divine communication was to be put into writing by them. But not that the quality of, of, of inspiration was different. So according to that, Shaiti, even there, the, the words would be chosen. The bottom line is that we, we, t- we, play, we, we treat the words of the prophets with exactly the same care that we treat the words of the five books of Moses. Are we, ready? Are we together so far? Yeah. Um, well, yes, first of all, um, a prophet has the power, the authority, to order Jews to break Jewish law. Um, there's a discussion of whether when he says so, he has to say God told me or not. Some say even if he doesn't tell it. The fact that he's a genuine prophet can give him the power, the ability, to tell Jews to break Jewish law. So, for example, um, um, the um, contest between Elio and the prophets of Baal, where this took place in the area of Haifa, in the Carmel Mountains, where he said to them, um, I'm going to make a contest. People were divided. Sometimes they were, would f- serve Baal, sometimes they would serve God. And uh, he said, well, let's, let's make a contest and see who's, ru- who's true, who's right. We'll both build the altars. You, priests of Baal, build your altar. I'll be my altar. And we'll both put wood and animals on the, on the altar. And then we'll call out that the ones you believe in will send fire from heaven. And we'll see who sends fire from heaven. Whether well, Baal sends it, you're right. And if, and if God says, I'm right. They loved that idea. They're a little nuts, I think, but they loved that idea. They built their altar, they put on the wood, they put on the animals, and they start doing their incantations, their magical routines, and calling out, and so forth and so on. Nothing happens, of course. And then uh, Eliot starts making fun of them. Get louder. Maybe he's asleep, you know. <laughs> Wake him up. Or maybe he's on vacation in Ethiopia. You know? <laughs> You'll attract his attention. Right? And nothing happens, of course. Then Elio builds an altar, and he puts on the wood and the, and the animal, and he says, bring buckets of water. They douse the whole thing with water. You know, it's sopping wet. And then he calls upon God to, to uh, send down fire. And the fire comes down, and the people all say, Hashem will look him, Hashem will look him, Hashem is God, Hashem is God. Only one problem. He's offering a sacrifice in Haifa. That's against the law, boys and girls. You can't do that. When the temple is standing in Jerusalem, it's forbidden to offer a sacrifice anywhere else in the world. For a Jew, anyway. Not for a non-Jew, but for a Jew. So, how did he do that? Answer, because he's a prophet. He has the authority to do that. He could tell you to fight a war on Shabbos. He could tell you to eat pigs. If it's a one-time, one-time thing, and if it doesn't compromise, I don't worship then he can tell Jews individually or collectively to do something that breaks any Jewish law. Therefore, a book that says someone told Jews to break a Jewish law had better come from prophecy and not from writings, not from Ruch HaKodesh. Ruch HaKodesh doesn't give you the power to do that. So that would put a limitation on what could be understood in such a book. Now, some of the books, like, let's say, Miguel's Esther, tell stories of what happened. If what's based in the story is only Ruch HaKodesh, then there's a limitation on what, they, on, on what the figures in the story can do. If it describes them as doing something which only a prophet can do, then the book has to be discarded as puzzle, as wrong, as not, not genuine. So that's one difference. There'll be whether, he, whether you say that it's rooted in Ruch HaKodesh or rooted in prophecy. Um, okay, so that's the question of, of uh, language. Now, I told you that Moses' prophecy is different. I want to I want to show you what the Rambam writes about Moses. 
he writes something really astonishing. I want to be careful here. I don't want to ruin this thing. I tell you now is contained in a commentary called the Meshechachma, who also authored the book Or Samech, from which the name of this yeshiva is taken, very simply Davinsk. And in, in Hilchos Yisodia Torah, the laws of the fundamentals of the Torah, Maimonides describes prophecy and describes the difference between the prophecy of all other prophets versus Moses. And he says the following. Moshe Rabbeinu, the people of Israel, did not believe in him because of the miracles that he did. Because someone who believes on the basis of miracles, in his heart there is uncertainty. Because perhaps those miracles were done via magic or sorcery. Now, this, these words of the Rambam have been very widely misunderstood. Listen again, see if you, if you hear it. A person who believes something, or particular that a person's a prophet or something else, and believes on the basis of miracles, he has in his heart uncertainty because it's possible that the miracle could be done with magic or sorcery. Is the Rambam saying that magic and sorcery are genuine? Not necessarily. And in fact, in the laws of Avodah Zorah, he says explicitly that it's all fake, it's all phony, it's all what you call a chiza senaim. It's sleight of hand. None of it is genuine. He's not here commenting on the strength and power of sorcery and, and, and uh, uh, magic. He's saying someone who believes, someone, someone, some ones, there will be people, some people who believe, they won't believe completely because they will think that it could be sorcery and magic. Really, sorcery and magic are zero. They're complete phony. Have no re reality whatsoever, but someone might believe it on those. Be, be, think that it might be so, and his belief won't be solid. So, if you want the belief to be solid, it can't be verified only on the basis of of uh, of miracles. You know, as if you're the one who's trying to create credibility, you have to know that for many people, if the means of get, of, of creating credibility is miracles, it's going to be limited, because many people aren't going to have full credibility. Not that Rambam is, is, is signing on that magic and, prof and sorcery have power. So, he says, all the miracles that Moses did in the, in the wilderness, he did because of the need of the hour. Something was happening for which the, the miracles were required. Not to bring a proof on his prophecy. The fact that he was accepted as a prophet is not based on miracles, all the miracles were for some other reason than that. Um, he had to uh, protect the Jewish people from the, the uh, pursuing Egyptians. So he split the sea and, uh, and then drowned them in the sea. They needed, they needed food, so he brought them the, the manna from heaven. They were thirsty, so he uh, got the water from the rock. Um, the congregation of Korach denied him. The earth opened them up. Now, there, um, it does sound like maybe they were uh, d disagreeing about his prophecy. There it says, if God sent me, then let the earth swallow them up. And if, uh, if the earth doesn't swallow them up and they die a peaceful death, then God didn't send me. To read those words, it sounds like they were denying his whole mission, denying his whole authority. 
But that's not true because the next words are uh, that the, the, the choice of Aaron as a high priest was something which I didn't author. It wasn't my, wasn't my choice. I didn't uh, have any influence on its taking place. As the commentators point out there, the only question was, how come your brother is the high priest? It looks like nepotism, Moshe. You're the king, and you make your, your, your brother the high priest, and uh, even if you didn't do it without God's authority, maybe he only said so because you wanted it. We're suspicious that you had a hand in making your brother a high priest. But no one denied his, his prophecy, and, as, and you'll see the reason why shortly. And the well, same with all the other miracles. So then, Maimonides says, what then was the source of their belief in him? Because at Sinai, where our eyes saw, and not the eyes of someone else, and our ears heard, and not the ears of someone else, the fire and the voices and the flames, and Moses approached the, the smoke and the voice speaks to him, and we hear, Moshe, Moshe, Lechem Olehem, Moses, Moses, go speak to them. This and this. Say this, say that. We witnessed Moses' prophecy. We saw it ourselves. That's the strongest possible evidence you can have that he's a prophet, that you yourself experience the prophecy directly. Now, it's very interesting. He says here, and he reiterates it in the, in the guy that perplexed. It's like us overhearing a conversation with somebody else. God wasn't speaking to us, but he allowed us to hear himself, God, speaking to Moses. And this is explicit in the Torah, chapter 19. It says, I will come and I'll speak to you, and the people will hear me speaking to you, and they'll believe in you forever. So Maimonides quotes that. Uh, and then it says in various verses, God didn't cut a, uh, make a covenant with our ancestors, he made it with us directly. And how do we know this? Only because of that. It says, only because of Sinai that they believed in him. Because the verse says, Behold, I'm coming to you in the thickness of the cloud in order that the people shall hear as I speak to you, and in you they will believe forever. So that's how uh, the, the uh, credibility of Moses' prophecy was established, which, he says, implies that all the miracles he did before that didn't get established. It didn't get the quality of that the belief in you is going to be a permanent feature of the world. It's really quite remarkable that an event 3,300 plus years ago, which established a certain principle, from that day to this, the world has never been without an acceptance of that belief, let alone the fact that, uh, well, there are two billion Christians, many of whom are post-Christians, but uh, and a billion and a half Muslims who aren't post-Muslims, <laughs> and they all accept that these events took place. The Jewish people has continuously borne witness to this to these events for the last three thousand three hundred years. Very little that was established 3,000 years ago by any experience that people had has lasted all those generations without being either forgotten or misinterpreted or uh, replaced by something newer and fancier. Um, it's a really quite a remarkable uh, achievement considering how, how, how small a proportion of world population we are. Now, um, he then says that this is different from all the other prophets because the other prophets were temporary. They, 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 no, one ever heard, no one ever heard God speaking to them. They become prophets because Moses told, uh, told us when they fulfilled certain conditions, what I mentioned before, that we should treat them as prophets. Now, He says, one of the features of all other prophets 
is that they can't prophesy when they want. Either prophecy comes to them or it doesn't come to them. Moses isn't like that. Anytime he wanted prophecy, the spirit would envelop him and the prophecy would come to him. <clears throat> now, why were the other prophets limited in this way? Because to be in a, a mental and spiritual condition to receive prophecy requires a certain amount of focus, a certain amount of inner organization, a certain amount of inner elevation. And the other prophets had to work on themselves to put themselves in that condition, not Moses. He didn't have to work on himself to put himself in that condition. He was continuously prepared to receive prophecy. Okay, up to here. So he was different from the other ones. But now the Rambam adds two words. Just like the ministering angels. Angels who aren't physical at all. The word malach in Hebrew really means agent, not messenger. It means agent. Shliach doesn't mean messenger either. It means agent. Malach is a malacha. Malacha is a kind of form of action. They're agents. They, not being physical, are always focused. Their whole, their whole essence is to do what God commands. So they're always ready. Of course they're already. That's what they are. If they weren't ready, they wouldn't exist. But a human being got to that condition of being like Malachi Shoris. The Ramah says that word for word. And therefore, he says, he could prophesy whenever he wanted. When people came and asked him questions, he says, Imdu of Eshba, Mayitzav Hashem Lechem. Wait here for a moment, and I'll tell you what God will command me. How does he know God's going to command him? Maybe it'll come next year. Not with Moses. He could say, wait, and I'll tell you right away. Because he could, he could, he could receive that immediately. Now, uh, he says, God promised him this. And where did he promise this? As a prelude to the, to the, um, to the giving of the Torah at Sinai, God told the people, I'll tell you something which very few people know now, God told the people to separate husband and wife for three days. On the third day, the Torah will be given. It was given you the third day, fourth day. Three, uh, three days separation. Why should they separate? Well, having marital intercourse creates a certain tumor, a certain defilement, disqualification, and God wanted to give it to them when they're all to her, when they're all pure. So therefore, they shouldn't live together. Why three days? If a man has a seminal omission, he goes to the mikveh, and at nighttime, he's pure. It's a one-day affair. But a woman who receives semen, and who might then expel it over the next two days, anytime she expels semen, she, her, her tumor continues. So the three days is for the women. Dafka for the women. The men are finished by, the night, by nightfall. No. That everyone should be Torah. Now, after the Torah was given, God is, tells Moses, tell them that now you can resume marital relations. Go tell them, go back to your tents. And the next words in what God tells Moses are, And you stand here before me. No, you don't have to be a genius to figure out if they're getting permission to go back to their wives and husband will go back to the other and he's told, and you stay in here with me. He means you're not. They're going back to their, to their wives and the husbands and you're not. Halamarita. You read, you learn from this, you call a Nevi'im, she'anavua mislakach chosrim le'olehem. All the other ones are prophets. His brother and sister were prophets. Go back, to your, go back to your families. And now he says, when it says go back to the tents, which is taken literally and specifically to, to refer to marital relations, but the Rambam says it means all tzorche aguf, all the needs of the body. And that's why they don't separate from their wives. Moshe Rabbeinu, lo chazay lo ol arishon. Moses didn't go back to his original tent. Or be called a domala. 
he separated himself from, from his wife and everything that's similar to it. His mind was attached to the rock of the world, meaning God. The glory that he got from Mount Sinai never, never deserted him. And his face shone with a, with a heavenly light. And he became sanctified like angels. Twice in the same paragraph, Maimonides says that Moses became like a like a like a an angel. That's really quite a strong statement. It's quite a strong statement. And the truth is that the Ramchal, whose sefer we're we're learning, the Moshe Chaim Lutzato, he writes in his in his sefer Masil Shishorim. In the last chapter, he's discussing two qualities of great spiritual people. One is Tara, which is purity, and the other is Kedusha, which is holiness. And he says, there's a great contrast between the two of them. Tara, purity means, as far as you're interacting with the physical world, take as little as possible, because everything you take from the physical world can compromise you. It can stimulate desires for pleasure, or it can lead to excess, or it can distract you to the point where, do we have the latest seasoning for the steak? You didn't get the seasoning for the steak? Go to the, to the, to the McCullough and get the seasoning. How can I make steak without the seasoning? You know, that kind of thing, where people become absorbed in the physical and distracted, and then their, their character, uh, their interpersonal relations suffer, as the rest. Tara means stay as, 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 as uh, limited in your interaction with the physical world as possible. That's next to top, not the top. The top is Kedusha. Kedusha is holiness. Holiness tolerates the physical because it can be elevated and made holy. So you don't have to live it in that way. And he brings a raya from the, from the altar in the, in the temple. What did the altar do? Well, it received sacrifices. The fattest, best possible quality meat and the best wine and the best oil and the best flour all consumed on the, the altar, and indeed in Hebrew language, uh, it's called Achila. It's called Achila's Mizbech and Achila's Adam. That's the way, the way people eat, so the, 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 um, the altar eats. So says the Ramchal, that's holiness, and it's not limited. On the contrary, it's gushing in the physical. A human being can get to that point also. Maybe the gushing is too strong, but he doesn't have to limit and be, um, how should I say, on guard because he can elevate the physical. There are certain mitzvahs of, of eating, and when, when you perform them with the right kavanah, you too can, can become, uh, achieve a certain holiness. The kohanim were the ones who had more mitzvahs of eating than anybody else, and, uh, and they expressed, expressed their holiness. So um, the idea of being, of being a malach, a man being a malach, says the, says the Ramchal, doesn't mean being cut off from the physical like the angels. The angels have a certain holiness, but holiness for a man enables him to integrate the physical also. No, you, no malach can do that. No, a malach doesn't have a physical part altogether. There's no re relationship to the physical world. This is the special condition that Moses had. And as we'll see tomorrow when I do more detail, this, the, the distinction of who he is casts a, a gigantic distinction on the, the kind of prophecy that he, that he gave. This is background to, to get to that point. We'll get to it tomorrow.